We're going to continue with the fifth chapter of Cold Comfort Farm. Sorry, my video got cut off due to lack of data before, but Flora Post has just awoken on her first morning at Cold Comfort Farm. Has heard some arguing about the loss of a cow's leg, what chicken feathers are best used for, apparently making hats for dolls is their best, the best use, and has come down to the kitchen to find Adam Lansbrith cleaning the dishes with a twig, cutting up a turnip. He needs the door open so he can attend to the livestock and to the dishes at the same time. And now Flora wants to know about breakfast, and we will pick up there. Is there any bread and butter? And some tea? I don't much care for porridge. And have you a piece of clean newspaper? I could just put on the corner of this table. A half sheet would be enough to protect me from the porridge. It seems to have got tossed about a bit this morning, doesn't it? There's tea in the jar, yonder, and bread and boy in the crocket. Ye mun find them yourself, Robert Post child. I have my task to do, and my watch to keep, and I cannot run here and run there to fetch newspapers for a capsule win it. Besides, we've troubles enough at cold comfort without being in such a thing as a clamouring newspaper to upset us and fritten us. Oh, have you? What troubles? asked Flora. Interestingly, interestedly, as she busily made fresh tea, it occurred to her that this might be a good opportunity to learn something about the other members of the family. Haven't you enough money? For she knew that this is what is the matter with nearly everybody over twenty-five. There's money enough in the farm, Robert Post child, but it is all turned to sourness and ruin, I tell you. Here Adam advanced nearer to the interested Flora and thrust his lined and wrinkled face indelibly etched by the corrosive acids of his dim, monotonous years, almost into hers. There's a curse on Cold Comfort Farm. Indeed, said Flora, withdrawing slightly. What sort of a curse? Is that why everything looks so gone to seed and whatnot? <coughs> There's no seeds, Robert Post, child. That's what I'm telling you. The seeds wither as they fall into the ground, and the earth will not nourish them. The cows are barren, and the sows are fairing, and the king's evil, and the queen's bane, and the prince's heritage ravages our crops. Because why? Because there's a curse on us, Robert Post, child. But look here, couldn't something be done about it? I mean, surely Cousin Amos could get a man down from London or something. This bread is really not at all bad, you know. Surely you don't bake it here. Or perhaps Cousin Amos could sell the farm and buy another one, without any curse on it, in Berkshire or Dorchester? Adam shook his head. A curious veil, like a withdrawing of intelligence from the eyes of a tortoise, flickered across his face. Nay, that have always been stark at us at cold comfort. Tis impossible for any of us to dream of leaving here. There's reasons why we can't, Mrs. Stark at her. She's sought us staying here. Tis her life. Tis the life in her veins. Cousin Judith, you mean? She doesn't seem very happy here. Nay, Robert Post, child. I mean the old lady. Old Mrs. Stark at her. His voice sunk to a whisper so the Flora had to bend her tall head to catch the last words. He glanced upward, as though indicating that old Mrs. Stark at her was in heaven. Is she dead, then? asked Flora who was prepared to hear anything at Cold Comfort Farm, even that the family was kept in order by a domineering ghost. Adam laughed a strange sound, like the wickering snicker of a teasel in anger. <laughs> nay, she am alive, right enough. Her hand lies on us like iron, Robert Post's child, but she never leaves her room, and she never sees no one but Miss Judith. She's never left the farm this last twenty years. She stopped suddenly. As though he had said too much, he began to withdraw to his dark corner of the kitchen. Ah, Mum, clear the dishes now. Leave me in peace, Robert Post, child. Oh, all right. But I do wish you would call me Miss Post, or even Miss Flora, if you'd rather be all futile. I do feel that Robert Post's child every time is rather a mouthful, don't you? Leave me in peace, I'm Mum, clear the dishes. Seeing that he was really bent on doing some work, Flora let him be, and thoughtfully finished her breakfast. So that was what it was. Mrs. Starkadder was the curse of cold comfort. Mrs. Starkadder was the dominant grandmother theme, which was found in all typical novels of agricultural life, and sometimes in novels of urban life, too. It was, of course, right and proper that Mrs. Starkadder should be in possession at Cold Comfort Farm. Flora should have suspected her existence from the beginning. Probably it was Mrs. Starkadder, otherwise Aunt Ada Doom, who had sent the postcard with the reference to, gen to generations of vipers. Flora was sure 
but the old lady was Aunt Ada Doom, and none other. It was a most Aunt Ada-ish thing to do to send a postcard like that. Flora's mother would have said it once, Flora was sure. That's typical of Ada. If she intended to tidy up life at cold comfort, she would find herself opposed at every turn by the influence of Aunt Ada. Flora was sure that this would be so. Persons of Aunt Ada's temperament were not found of a tidy life, were not fond of a tidy life. Storms were what they liked. Plenty of rows and doors being slammed and jaws sticking out and faces white with fury and faces brooding in corners and faces making unnecessary fuss at breakfast and plenty of opportunities for gorgeous emotional wallowings and, par and partings forever and misunderstandings and interferings and spyings and above all, managing and intriguing. Oh, they did enjoy themselves. They were the sort that went trampling all over your pet stamp collection or whatever it was and then spent the rest of their lives atoning for it, but you would rather have had your stamp collection. Flora thought of the higher common sense by the Abbey Foss Maugri. This work had been written as a philosophic treatise. It was an attempt not to explain the universe, but to reconcile man and his in to his inexplicability. But in spite of its impersonal theme, the higher common sense provided a guide for civilized persons when confronted with a dilemma of the Aunt Ada type. Without actually laying down the rules of conduct, the higher common sense outlined a philosophy for the civilized being, and the rules of conduct followed automatically. Where the higher common sense was silent, the Pensees, the same author, gave, often gave guidance. With such guides to follow, it was not possible to get into a mess. Flora decided that before she tackled Aunt Ada, she would refresh her spirit by rereading part of the higher common sense, the famous chapter on preparing the mind for the twin invasion by prudence and daring in dealing with substances not included in the outline. Probably she would only have time to study a page or two, for it was not easy to read, and part of it was in German and part in Latin, but she thought that the case was sufficiently serious to justify the use of the higher common sense. The Pensees were all very well to fortify one's spirit against everyday pricks and scourges, Aunt Ada, Ada Doom. The crux of life at cold comfort was another matter. While she was eating the last piece of bread and butter, Flora was thinking that there might be a difficulty about her food while she was at cold comfort, for possibly Adam was cooking to the family and eat porridge prepared by Adam. She could not and would not. She would probably have to approach her cousin Judith and have what older people love to call a little talk about it. On the whole, cold comfort was not without its promise of mystery and excitement. She had hopes that Aunt Ada Doom would, prove, would provide both, and she wished that Charles would have been there to enjoy it with her. Charles dearly loved a gloomy mystery. Adam, meanwhile, had finished slicing turnips and had gone out into the yard where a thorn tree grew and returned with a long thorn-spiked twig from its branches. Flora watched him with interest while he turned the cold water on to the crusted plates and began picking at the incrustations of porridge with his twig. She bore it as long as she could, for she could hardly believe her own eyes, and then she said, What on earth are you doing? Clatter in the dishes and all that boast, child. But surely you could do it much more easily with a little mop, a nice little mop with a handle. Cousin Judith ought to get you one. Why don't you ask her? It would get the dishes cleaner, and it would be so much quicker, too. I don't want a little mop with a handle. I've used a thorn twig these fifty years and more, and what was good enough then is good enough now, and I don't want to clatter the dishes more quickly neither. It pesses the time away, and takes me me thoughts off me little wild bird. But, suggested the cunning Flora, remembering the conversation which had roused her that morning at the dawn, if you had a little mop, you could wash the dishes more quickly. You could have more time in the cowshed with the dumb beasts. Adam stopped his work. This had evidently struck home. He nodded once or twice without turning round, as though he were pondering it, and Flora hastily followed up her advantage. Anyway, I should buy one for you when I go to I shall buy one for you when I go into Beershon tomorrow. At this moment there came a soft rap at the closed door which led out into the yard, and a second later it was repeated. Adam shuffled across to the door, muttering, Ma little Wennet, and flung it wide open. A figure which stood outside, wrapped in a long green cloak, rushed across the room up the stairs so quickly that Flora only had the merest glimpse of it. She raised her eyebrows. Who is that? she asked. 
though she was sure she knew. "'Ma Cowdling, ma little elfine,' said Adam listlessly, picking up his thorn twig which had fallen, 